Okay. So Latin squares. So we've talked about blocking on a nuisance variable, right? Um, we've and repeated measures, of course, is a special case of blocking. The nuisance variable there is it's it's a person, but we can factor that out. That's it's the ultimate blocking variable is using the same person. <coughs> but we can just block these two. That's not a problem. We can also do something that we're not going to talk about in this course. Uh, you will learn about graduate school. If you go to graduate school, it's called ANCOVA, which is analysis of covariance. And what you do is you, you, it statistically removes a nuisance variable. It's not nearly as accurate. It's, all, it's somehow funny as well. But it's not nearly as accurate uh, as doing blocking. It's, it's complicated and it involves a lot more assumptions. But it can be done. What's funny, sir? What's so funny, John? You should do this as quick on this channel and tell me now. Okay, that's enough. You're not getting older. Are you getting older? I mean, is this still getting old? Yes. <laughs> no, it isn't. It's yeah. still going. <laughs> yeah. No, it's <laughs> over, buddy. Uh, okay, so. <laughs> you know, that's enough. All right. <clears throat> that. That. Okay, shh. Please. Okay, so you can do any call that uh, you will learn that in graduate school for the grad school. Um, what if you two nuisance variables? Which is something that happens. It's certainly possible. Um, so now you have two nuisance variables and a third variable that's your independent variable. You said John, please. No, I'm, I'm trying to do my job, okay? I promise. Okay. I'm just that I'm thinking and then you interrupt me. I gotta write it home. Okay. So you gotta kind of put them together. Now you could think of it, you could cross them all, you could have interactions, but that's going to be really hard because we have to find people, for example, in different blocks and block them on, that's going to be really difficult. So what we can do instead is put these together in, in a different fashion. So you put one nuisance variable in a row, one in a column, and then independent, levels of the independent variable in each cell. This is something called a Latin square. Okay. This design isn't horrible. It's not common, is all. So, what you can do is you're going to put one nuisance variable in rows, one in the columns, and then we're going to have independent that a level of the independent variable in each cell. So it's going to look like that. Oh, that's cool. So we have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, and then we have A, B, C, and D in this case, by the way, are not independent variables. They are different levels of the one independent variable we're interested in. So there's four different levels of variables? There's four variables, uh, levels of the variable, sir. Yes, now I just made the same mistake. I said that it's not that. <laughs> yeah, there are four levels of the independent variable, four levels of columns for blocking, and four levels of rows for blocking. Um, and you can see this, for example, if you had, if you want to cross all these, right, and, and, and get interactions and all that fun stuff, you would now need a 4x4x4 four by four by four design, which is uh, 16, 40, 16 times 4, 32, uh, so you need 4 times 4 is 16 times 4, 36, 72 levels, 72 cells. You're not going to find, seven, you're not going to get subjects, you can't. It's going to be really hard to do. That's why this was invented. And if it's 5, it's going to be 5 times 5, 25 times 5. Now you need 125 cells. 6 is going to be, I believe, times. No, 7, 49, 7. Uh, bigger. So, yeah. It's crazy. So this is nice. This is a way to deal with it. Put that over there. So A, B, C, and D again are levels of a factor, non-independent variables. Each level occurs once in each ordinal position. The first position, second, third, fourth. Dave, I don't know if I'm cutting ahead of what you have, but can you can you give me an example of how there would be four levels of independent variables? Oh sure. So it's uh, four different what could that be? Well, it could be any variable, so it could be four different smells. I picked that for a reason, actually, because this is an example that I have. An honors thesis student of mine did use a design like this once, where she had an 8 by 8 square. So she had 64 things, but 8 
but not an 8x8x8 eight 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 design, which would be a hellish nightmare to collect the data. So there would be four different smells? Yes. And then we have four we have four levels of the new experimental here, and four levels of one here. Okay. Okay. So and it's just something we can measure, but we we know it have an effect. Whoops. Sorry about that. So each level. Let's go back. Good. Okay. Each row, each column has each level once, see? It's only, here's, here is once in there, once there. So A, let's look at A. It's once in row one, column one, once in row two, and column two, once in row three, column one. Now, by the way, the head doesn't have to go A, B, C, D, and then shift it over. Like, there's no reason that the one that's here in three couldn't be in here in two. And in fact, what you should do is do that randomly. Uh, is choose where the levels go, as long as within those constraints, you should do that randomly. There are ways to do it. One of the ways is, in fact, uh, again, good level, good graduate level statistics book. We'll have a table in the back of, of Latin squares. It'll just have a table and you just pick one. Uh, so randomly, say there's 10 different possibilities, so, or whatever, roll dice and say, okay, I'll take that. That's one way to go. Um, you can, there are computer, there are websites that'll do this for you too. That'll just give you a Latin score. And they'll sort of basically where the A and the Where the A's, B's, C's, D's, D's, and F's go. Yeah. Yep. So you need equal numbers of rows, columns, and then variable levels. And then what you get is X equals mu plus alpha plus beta plus gamma plus epsilon. But, and that looks familiar. But, so any score equals the grand mean plus the rows the columns, the independent variable. This is the one we care about, by the way. And, of course, error. Or residual. It's often called residual in this kind of analysis. I don't know why. What is it? What's, what's, what's left over? So that's why it's called residual. Yes. And it's a, very, it's a nice general term, residual, for any kind of leftover variance. It's, you'll see it a lot. Uh, I think it shows up in SPSS, actually. So the analysis of variance looks like this. We have, by the way, what you have, you have P rows, P columns, P levels of the independent variable, and then the residuals P minus one times P minus two, which will give you big N minus one. So with our example we had before, we had four rows and four columns and four levels. We have three, three, and three. <coughs> Right? And then we get what? Six, right? Because that's going to be three times two, six. Nine and six is 15. Oh, beautiful. And there's going to be 16 possible degrees of freedom. This is a lot simpler because you said that you need equal number of rows, columns, and infinite variables, so it's a lot simpler to build. Well, you, there's no way those are ever going to be different. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Unless it's some sort of really hard question when you're in graduate school on a midterm. I'm just, that happened. <laughs> yeah, that happened. It was an incomplete Latin square. My God, what a nightmare trying to figure out how to analyze that. It's like, how do you do that? I don't know. What do you do? The prof was right, but he'd leave the room. He'd know we'd just talk with each other. Does anybody know how to do this Latin square? No. So that's not so bad. And the only the error term is residual. So you divide independent mean squared for independent variable by mean squared for residual. Uh, you can do these on. SPSS again using general linear model, but you have to say one, one, one for the effects kind of thing. Like, uh, sorry, that it's like rows, columns, and then variable. It can be done. So this kind of design, if you can meet, it has rather stringent assumptions, right? And some of the assumptions, I mean, if you take a look, there's no interactions. Just like with blocking variables though, right? How, how do you know there's no interactions? You can't know that. So you better be damn sure there aren't any. So you're gonna have to look at old previous research and say, okay, does this blocking variable ever, ever interact with this independent variable? Does this one interact with the independent variable? Do these two blocking variables ever interact with each other? 
right? So you've got to make sure that's the case. Well, the nice thing is, by the way, if you do have interactions, where's it going to go? Look at the model. It's only going to make the error bigger. So it's going to make it, you're not going to make a fool of yourself by saying something happened, but you might miss something. Um, you also need equal levels, number of levels of rows, columns, and independent variables, which is not incredibly um, easy to find an experiment that's going to work like that. My student, I think it was 2009, when my own student, John Cicero, actually did an experiment that we use a lot in square. It's the only time I've ever seen one in my career um, that I was in, involved in. Uh, I, of all the times I've reviewed papers for journals, I've seen one once. It just doesn't happen. But it's a, re it's a reasonable variable. It's a reasonable approach. There's nothing wrong with it. Okay? Unlike the nested design we talked about previously, which is just awful and you should avoid, you can, you can do these. But it's hard to meet all these assumptions. Questions about these things? 